Now, as you would have seen and heard on the news today, it's the 15th anniversary of the apology to stolen generations. And this has played directly into the debate about an Indigenous voice in exactly the way I predicted here on Australia Day. And listen to this interesting aside from the Prime Minister this week when discussing the likely coalition position. What we saw with the apology to stolen generations is that some people went out there and opposed that uh, advance, that moment in reconciliation, that step forward. And what we should not have here is a missed opportunity, uh, which is there. It's pretty clear what he is referring to. That was a very pointed and very telling reference because, yes, Peter Dutton himself rejected Parliament's apology back in 2008, a stance he has since admitted was a mistake. And so there we go. A couple of weeks further on, Peter Dutton has repeated his apology about the apology in Parliament today, saying sorry directly to Indigenous people and explaining the practical concerns about real Indigenous trauma that led him to reject that symbolism of the apology at the time. I remember clearly attending Palm Island where I brought back the body of an Indigenous woman in a body bag who had been thrust off a cliff to her death. And I remember thinking at the time that those instances were still occurring on a daily basis in 2008. And the judgement that I formed was that if we were to make an apology, it needed to be at a time when we had addressed and we had curbed that violence and those incidences. I failed to grasp at the time the symbolic significance to the stolen generation of the apology. It was right for Prime Minister Rudd to make the apology in 2008. It's right that we recognise the anniversary today. It's right that the government continues its efforts and in whatever way possible we support that bipartisan effort. Now, as I've said and written quite a bit, this is all the more reason that Peter Dutton will not want to be on the wrong side of history this time. And it's part of the reason I've always argued he might well decide to support the voice or at least allow Liberal MPs to argue and vote for either side of the debate. We will see. But so far, all Peter Dutton has done is ask reasonable questions and make reasonable points about how the debate and referendum should be contested. Others on the no side have continued to make increasingly desperate arguments against the voice. We hear the claims about how a voice will divide the nation or put race into the constitution, create apartheid, confer special privileges and a whole host of other arguments that just don't stack up and are designed really to stoke unjustified fears. But the latest arguments put by no advocates are perhaps the most absurd. They cite the extremist rantings of the black sovereignty movement and use this to try to pretend that the voice could undermine our sovereignty. This is an argument made by some of my friends and colleagues at The Australian and here at Sky. The end point is where Lydia Thorpe wants to take us, which is sovereignty to black Australia. That is the end point. That is what the Indigenous voice is all about. And if you vote yes to the Indigenous voice, you are voting well, yes to the cessation of sovereignty uh, of, uh, of, of the mainstream Australia in order that there is a black sovereignty. Look, I've got to say, this stuff is pretty silly. The black sovereign movement, the radical fringe, has most recently been given voice by Senator Lydia Thorpe. And Thorpe opposes the voice because it's not radical enough. Thorpe doesn't want a voice to Parliament. She wants Indigenous people to reject the Parliament and claim their own nation status. My focus now is to grow and amplify the black sovereign movement in this country, something we've never had since this place was established. There is a black sovereign movement out there that no one wants to listen to. So I'll be their voice. Yeah, so that's Thorpe, eh? But conservative voice opponents are somehow saying the voice will fall victim to her radicalism, even though she rejects the voice precisely because it's not radical enough. This is a war! They are killing our men! And they are still raping our women! 
Yeah, Senator Thorpe is off the charts. Her frustration with The Voice, because it accepts our parliament and is only advisory, well, that actually demonstrates why The Voice is OK. And, look, no push for black sovereignty would ever work through The Voice, even if anyone tried it, because it would make a mockery of The Voice, make it irrelevant and allow parliaments to easily ignore it. Besides, The Voice has no power. It only exists under our sovereignty and the parliament remains, retains all of the authority. Ironically, the real worry here is Thorpe in the here and now. As a crucial crossbench senator, she has more power than any voice ever would, and she attacks our sovereignty. Mind you, Thorpe's happy to have a seat in our sovereign parliament and take a salary from sovereign taxpayers. Anyway, the point is nothing can overturn our sovereignty short of Beijing invading. Our parliaments are our authority. They're dependent upon our sovereignty and our courts implement the law under an authority derived directly from our sovereignty. Even Mabo and native title laws were only delivered under our sovereignty and can only continue to function under Australian sovereignty. Seriously, to try to discredit the entire idea of a voice because one voice opponent is ranting about sovereignty is like trying to oppose the whole idea of parliamentary democracy because an incoherent radical like Senator Thorpe got elected to it. Let's continue the yes and no debate about The Voice. But let's keep it real.